Okay, I think it's time to start with this seminar. Uh, welcome here in the room and also welcome to the people that are following us online um, today. So this is a poultry world seminar. I'm Rieke Ploegmakers. I'm the host of uh, All About Feed. And um, uh, yeah, today I will uh, host this poultry uh, world seminar. Uh, so today we're going to talk about sustainability and welfare and we have four experts here that will share their insights and thoughts with us um, on this topic. So before uh, I will welcome our first speaker, I'd like to address that it's possible to ask questions. Um, we have the presentation and then we have time for questions. For the people joining us online, um, there's a chat box and uh, you can ask questions via the chat box, but we're not able to answer them here in the room. So they will uh, be followed up later on, or they, they will be sent to the speakers. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, it for me. So <laughs> I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Annemarie Neteson. She's Global Senior Advisor Welfare, Sustainability and Compliance at the AVGEN Group. And in her presentation, she will talk about global, global developments in poultry welfare and sustainability. So let's give a warm welcome to Annemarie. Thank you for very much, uh, everybody, for joining. And thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to uh, give the first uh, sp speech today. So I would like to... Uh, talk this time about uh, poultry welfare and about poultry sustainability from a global perspective. The first on poultry welfare is about the Poultry Welfare Alliance. The International Poultry Welfare Alliance is a multi-stakeholder group across the chain. So it includes also, for instance, uh, YUM with the KFC and, and McDonald's, but also producers and Aviagen, Corp, Hamrex, they are also a member. <coughs> and together, They've been uh, joining up on welfare because they consider welfare is very important. And what we face is that um, welfare is important. It's a top concern for concerners, consumers, but how, how do we deal with welfare? So from the stakeholders, there was a, a, a need for a, a system of outcome-based welfare measures that will help to communicate about welfare but also that you can have these key welfare indicators in which you can improve welfare over time in a robust and, and, and fair way. And then we go back to the basis of what is a key welfare indicator, and there's a number of key welfare indicators that exist. So on the one hand, you have the animal-based, the outcome-based welfare indicators, where you can see on the animal what is the welfare, and there is a resource or input-based welfare indicator where you, they are more on the system. So an example of animal-based is, is chick comfort, bolt comfort, or food pet health. And on the, on the resource-based, an example is what type of production system do you have and the number of enrichments or something like that. So the advantages of resource-based is, is it's easy to measure, and you can also translate that very easily to an audit or regulatory requi requirement. But the disadvantage is that they can be subjective and arbitrary. And what we also often see, that they do not always lead to improved welfare outcomes. And then it's getting, it feels, doesn't feel so good. The advantages of, of key welfare indicators, uh, which are animal-based, is that they are science, fact, and experience-based, so there should be all of that and they directly benefit the welfare of the animal in a measurable way. And they are applicable across management schemes and breeds or whatever. The disadvantage, never easy in life, is that they are time consuming to develop them, to measure, and the high repeatability and consistency across the patch, that is quite difficult. So the main drawback of resource space is that it doesn't even always improve welfare, and on, on, on animal based is that it's difficult to have them. Here you have an example of, of how that uh, can work out. Uh, in the Netherlands, you have uh, Dutch retail, which is uh, 
the 50 grams, the conventional, which is the standard breed and beta lever. And for each of these systems, uh, measurements have been taken on based on a general uh, welfare score uh, developed across the sector, where there were five animal-based measures, mortality, food pets, hot burn, breast uh, irritation and, and scratches, but also three resource-based, where the beta Leven and the Dutch ret retail got some extra points based on stocking density, early feeding and enrichment. And then you can see here on the left side <coughs> that there are, is a difference in the welfare score between these systems. But if you look at the only the animal-based, the outcome-based uh, uh, out welfare scores, you can see that there's hardly a difference between the system. And this shows a little bit that so much is based on management, so the rest of the system is already quite good, and then it's the management decides what is the welfare score, and that makes it then a fairer system uh, for, the, for the farmer and for the animal itself, because the animal is the one who's perceiving the welfare. And if you're sitting in a system as an animal and you're part of a very good welfare system but you do not feel, doesn't feel so good, I'm not sure that is so uh, wonderful. So these uh, key welfare indicators, they have been uh, just developed. It is a reference guide, guidelines. You can find them at the IPWA website, uh, poultrywelfare.org. They will be launched either at the end of this year or early next year. And they're just definitions. They, you can see how you can uh, measure welfare. They give some guidance, but they're not restrictive. They're just guiding to help you develop your own systems. That was the welfare part. So this is globally uh, being developed now at the moment, and uh, going forward, there may be, uh, it will be updated. Now we go to sustainability. So in general, there is a welfare, uh, there is a definition uh, on sustainability. I stayed with the old subject, sorry. And that means it's meeting the needs of tomorrow without compromising the future. That was defined like that with the UN Brundtland Commission in 1987, already a long time ago. So the United Nations had then also developed uh, three pillars of sustainability, the environmental pillar, the economic pillar, and the social pillar. And these three pillars hold together the roof, or you also can say they need to be in balance. Because then, when they're all in balance, then you have sustainability. With the International Poultry uh, Council, that is the global association that represents more than 85 of the meat poultry sector, we have been looking where we, as a meat poultry sector, can make a difference for sustainability. So we've been going through all these three pillars, and for each pillar we have been looking where can we make a difference, and we call that the means. And for each of these means, then later, we have been putting them next to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So where for the 17 sustainable development goals, can we as a meat poultry sector make a difference? That's across the patch, across countries, and across the sectors. That together, we have been working out and signing that up, that document, uh, together with the FEO in 2019, and that is called the Declaration of Sao Paulo. So this way in which we as a poultry sector can make a difference, according to the Sustainable Development Goals, then each of you can find ways in which you can make a difference. And that together then shows how we as a poultry sector can contribute to sustainability in the terms that the whole world understands or they already talk in these terms. As Eviagen, we've signed up for this uh, Declaration of Sao Paulo, which means we have to start working with it. So this is Jan Hendricks, so that is our CEO, some of you know him. He's been signing up for that. He signed that document, but where that means that we all of Aviagen Group have to start working on it. We have already now our logo, a logo which is called Breeding Welfare and Sustainability. That is a new logo that is in part of that. And just to give a little bit of uh, more information about the Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17, as I said. We have also been looking, and uh, Evonik and Rabobank and a number of other companies have helped us uh, defining that as, as IPC. Where can we make the very most difference? And th then we have been choosing five, and it was very difficult to find these five, but for having a good message, that is important. 
And the one is zero hunger. So we, as poultry sector, we are feeding the world. Second, this, number three, SDG three, is good health and welfare, well-being. So we contribute to good health of people with the very good amino acids, a balanced amino acid package, which helps people grow in, into being robust people with intelligence and able to live their lives. We do that with a low impact on the planet, so that is SDG 13, with and from better quality education, so that's quality education number four, because education is just very important in training of people, and then with industry innovation and infrastructure ensuring good animal welfare and health. So that is number nine, because that is also an SDG, and we as a poultry sector are very strong on that one, on the innovation industry, but also on making the infrastructure. Think of if there's not an infrastructure in a region, then you cannot get up, set up a very good poultry sector. We as IPC, as IEFIA Gen, have now been taking that on board and looked, okay, what are we as a breeding company? And then what are we as a breeding company? And how can we link that to these top five sustainable development goals to get that message in a palatable way? On the left, you see which are our top five commitments. So as a breeding company, we are sitting on top of the chain. So it is very important, health, food safety, and food security, that is our top number one. Now top number two is biodiversity. Because diversity, the diversity we select from, that is the heart of our business. We can only select from the diversity that we have. And then we have our balanced breeding program. You maybe know us from that. And then because all these populations changes and the world changes all the time, then we have stockmanship and management and implementing good management tools for helping with our customers to get that right with the changing breeds that change all the time and improve all the time. And the fifth one is on transparency and communication. I find that the most difficult one because we as a poultry sector have not been doing that so much. We're learning that, but we should not shy away from that. And then we have been linking these with the sustainable development goals of the IPC. You can see that here around on the right. So for each of our tops, we have been dedicating a number of SDGs. And you can see that in the next one. So our first commitment, health, food safety, and food security means we have breeding programs across the world. Uh, we have high biosecurity. We have compartment status in many of our programs. And this global supply, night supply network and very high health status on how we put them in the airplanes or in the ships. And that links to zero hunger, good health and, wealth, uh, and welfare, and uh, the innovation part of uh, infra and infrastructure. Then, uh, by uh, diversity, we have many, many lines, and we have within the lines and in between the lines, we have a lot of diversity. That is our part of the future. There's just a few breeding companies left. This is where we take our responsibility. And it is also part of our broad product folio. So for every part of the world or for every type of market, we should try to have, according to the needs, a breed or product. This is where we are very proud of, uh, the balanced breeding program, where we breed and select for an ever-increasing number of traits. And ever, ever more, there's more on health and welfare. But you see FCR contributes to environmental impact in a positive way. And the other ones are also making the whole balance of the birds. And that contributes to zero hunger, the, the innovation part, and climate action with the better FCR. Then we have schools, we have technical specialists, we have stockmanship, we have our guides. That is the fourth uh, commitment with zero hunger and quality education. And then finally, the fifth commitment is on transparency. So we work with the International Poultry Council. We work with the global associations, but also with the local associations. We try to cooperate and contribute, not as Aviagen alone, but together with the rest of the sector, so that we get that message out and that we go into a dialogue with people uh, across the world, which is then quality education and also the infrastructure part. 
because together, welfare and sustainability, they cannot be separated. Welfare and sustainability, they're just one, or they should be one. If they're not, you have to think, how do I define welfare? What can I do about welfare? Or how do I define sustainability? What can I do about sustainability? Or how do I bring this, how do I define my business? So you then better be a bit clever, and then I'm sure they're inseparable. Because at the end of the day, good wealth and sustainability is good business. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Anneli, for your presentation. And if there are any questions in the room, uh, please raise your hand. And my colleague Sophie uh, is there with the microphone. Not at the, mo at the moment. Then uh, I have a question for you. Okay. So what about behavior? Are there any uh, key welfare indicators um, regarding behavior? Of animals. Yeah, in the IPPA key welfare ga indicator guide, they are not at this moment behavioral indicators. Also, gait is not really very much uh, in that because at this moment that is not robust enough. We as Aviagen, we have behavior and we have gait in our breeding program. But for gait on every Friday, our auditors are benchmarked. And if they are uh, away from the average, then they will be retrained to altogether audit in the same way. And it's not that far yet for the behavioral or the gait indicators. I think it will come in mm. the coming years. That, that will, I'm sure it will come there mm -hmm. with all these automated systems. And then we need to have a discussion mm. on about what we mean with a certain type of behavior. Yeah. But yes. Okay. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, no questions? Then I have another question for you. So um, how can companies uh, align with the sustainable development goals? Uh, as the meat poultry sector has worked on? And do you see uh, it as a good uh, way to show uh, how a group in the meat sector can make a di difference for sustainability? Yeah. I, I do think that it is a good communication tool. And I do think that it is uh, also good for yourself because I think most companies are already doing a lot, lot of things very well. And realizing that, I think it is good that you write that up and talk about that together. And if you do that in the framework of the sustainable development goals, as they were prioritized and as we have highlighted where as poultry sector we could make a difference, then you align with, with the whole sector and you have a good tool. Um, you can contact the International Poultry Council or you can send me an email. The International Poultry Council would be Nicolo, Nicolo as, a, as a male's name, at uh, internationalpoultrycouncil.org and my is amydeson at aviagen.com and then uh, we will see how we can help you in, uh, in making your own path and, and your own, com own uh, communication about it but also finding out uh, where you can make a difference for sustainability as a company or as an association. It can also be done for associations. Okay, then thank you uh, Annemarie for your presentation and on some thank questions. So let's give a warm applause for uh, Anna-Marie. Thank you. Then it's time for our second speaker. Uh, welcome, Geert Bruggeman. He's R&D manager at Arjenproof. And his presentation is titled Balancing on a Tightrope, Sustainability and Welfare. So let's give Geert uh, a warm welcome. Well, thank you, Mrs. Scher, <laughs> for the introduction. And thank you for attending the call today as well. And also to the viewers at home, a warm welcome uh, to join this talk. Indeed, today it's a difficult topic, uh, indeed as Agriproof, because I'm here, Brugman, representing Agriproof, part of the Royal Agrifern Group. It's a difficult exercise where we are in. We are really on a tight uh, rope. What I mean is, at one side, we need to create profit as a company. At the other hand, there are new challenges ahead. And these are welfare and sustainability. And that's what we talk about, how we solve that or try to solve that with Agriproof. Today, I don't want to judge. Eh? I want to open the discussion because no one today has the, health, uh, has the truth in hand. And eh? so happy to discuss you uh, afterwards with this presentation. And I hope. So balancing on the tightrope. Let's go ahead. So maybe the first question that we have to ask ourselves, 
do we still need additives? Because is it time, is it still the right place to use additives today? Here you see four arguments for that. At the right hand, the energy prices. I think you have seen your energy invoice <laughs> recently. Oh, the producers have the same problem. Today, the prices of all raw materials go very high. What means that we have to calculate this also to our customers. So almost no profit for them. The second one are borders. COVID was a nice example. When COVID was there, export from counties, it means also import to Belgium in this case, where Agriproof is uh, located, was almost impossible. And if possible, it was quite expensive. So margin, gone. The third one, war. War in Europe. Commodity prices went up. So it means to produce your local feed, also there, that price is too high. So margin to add additives goes down. And this has all as a consequence inflation, what we feel all today. And we means we don't want to pay extra in the shop. So in other words, we have to see how we can add additives in another way. Today, I don't want to bring a negative story. For sure not. What I want to claim today is that we have to rethink the agri-food business. And that's where also agri Improve wants to work on. And another element was indeed, when we look, as an example for agri Improve, in the past, we worked mainly on techno-economic optimizations. These techno-economic optimizations mainly by steering health. We have all seen the demonstrations of the young generations, for instance in Brussels, in the main capitals. What we saw there was that they don't claim only health, but also environment. Here you see what are the planetary boundaries, and it's already produced, or the reference is not there, or yes, it's there, below. Uh, very early, 2000s. So there we was already predicted that nitrogen cycles and also emissions become a threat. Today, we are here. I heard by the previous talk, biodiversity. Yeah, the climate temperature changes. Biodiversity becomes a threat. And this is indeed translated, <coughs> like also said by the previous uh, speaker, in the Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, initiated by the United Nations. So it means, for agri firm, till today, we were merely making profit on concepts supporting animal health and subsequently growth. And we had a nice portfolio and geography. For instance, Brazil, products that with, uh, can, compete, uh, can out compete salmonella, as an example. Also, animal species, not only poultry, but also other ones. And also, all dealing with health issues. What we see today are threats, emerging threats. Perception and additives, not only for feed, but also for food. The impact on soil, water, and air, for instance, emissions, greenhouse gases. And we are blamed as an industry that we are the cause of a lot of these things. But now we become the victim as well. What I want to show as companies, like Agriproof, but also a lot of other companies, we can do it different. We are also part of the solution. Yeah? And for that, we have to consider two major changes. The first one is. For all animal species, so also poultry, we were always used to think in terms of food chain, food value chain, starting with raw materials, additives, with no history. They are there, for granted. And at the end, what's also for granted are eggs, meat, milk, and so on. That's not the truth. Today, we know that the raw materials are produced and have an influence on the environment. We have an ecological footprint. Yeah? So today, this is the whole food system. And in the middle of that, you see the food chain. We have to take consideration with sociocultural aspects. Everyone is different. Each culture wants to be respected. We have to cope with that. At the other hand, we have to cope with bioethics, animal welfare, high on the agenda. And on the other hand, geographic, environmental, and technology sciences all contribute to new possibilities 
that can influence the agri food chain. So at the end, we are we are in a spaghetti. A spaghetti, and where you pull on one noodle at one side, at the other side something else happens. And today we see it in the world happening like that. It's a global it's changing continuously, and how can we cope with that? So we have to find a system, in principle, how we can act as a company in this system. And the other case is that we have learned something from history. From history, we had very extensive livestock farming. Even the farmer knew, his name, knew the name of his animal. This is gone today. It's massive. It's inclusive. I it's intensive. So mm, we solved it many years ago, several decades ago, by adding antibiotics. Wow, the miracle drug. Wow. <laughs> now we see indeed that antimicrobial cross resistance came. We acted as a company, like many other companies, by looking for substitutes of that. A lot of them. Yeah? But we have a problem now. It means all companies now end up somewhere with the same portfolio of products. Where is the differentiation power? Again, decreasing the profits. The cost is too high, and mainly today is selling reselling. We buy from suppliers and we resell it to farmers, for instance. So these elements we have to see where we can create uniqueness in the chain. So it's time for disruption. And now I will show you how Agrimproof can work on that. Yeah? And in the poultry industry, we have some concepts. Today, I will mainly focus on how we turned the, possible, the impossible into possible with medium chain fatty acids, as an example. This was positioned already 20 years ago in our company as a nice substitute for antibiotic replacement in the ban of antibiotics. But as we all know today, this beauty of nature is in danger. We cultivated, we used the medium chain fatty acids mainly from palm trees. Wow, the, the word palm is already shifting through the room. We see that palm today is mainly related to deforestation. Yeah. Also the decline of biodiversity. And if you want to see a nice example, use your phone, scan this QR code. There you will see what the impact is of harvesting plantations in this case in Asia, like Malaysia, yeah, on primates. Primate is quite closely related to us as human. So we want to see how we can deal with that. At Agrimproof, we try to solve this on two pillars. The first one is using the new type of gold in the market. It's called biomass. In the past it was bio-waste waste sounds negative, so today is biomass. Why biomass? Because it's available in large quantities. Retail produces a lot of non-sellable uh, uh, products, like bananas, for instance. Also in restaurants, a lot of leftovers, but even in your kitchen, you produce a lot of waste. And today, what's happening with that waste it's mainly landfilled or incinerated. So creating problems. So it means the bioways produce the greenhouse gases today, and this contaminates soil, water, or even air. Yeah? And it goes against the circular economy principles, like also shown by the previous speaker, yeah? because it's a loss of waste, a uh, loss of nutrients and energy. A lot drains through the ground that cannot be used, that is not accepted anymore. So bioproducts are a potential solution. Now Agrimproof has a preferential position in the Royal Agrifarm Group. What it means, we have now Bonda, yeah, which is a collector of all types of bio wastes, and by doing that, we can indeed reformulated diets based on the non-food principle. It means everything that cannot be used anymore for food 
we try to reformulate it into feed. So it means we can already contribute to that aspect. Agri-improve can I even add a functionality to that. And this is done together with a partner in the Netherlands. There was a press release on that, where the Bonda, Bonda products at left can be standardized. And by means of a two-step fermentation process, we can produce these next generation medium chain fatty acids. I will come back on the value propositions of them. Now, by having the standardized process of biomass at one side and having ethanol available, we can control the process very well. Why is ethanol an important building block here? Because it's also a byproduct. Today, it's massively available from the alcohol free beers and drinks and wines. So, we try to help also other industries to act as a sort of kind of carbon credit factory for them. So that we have a two-step fermentation. In the first step, we produce a short-chain fatty acids, and then we do chain elongation. And we have the next generation MCFAs. Also good to know is it happens at ambient temperature, so no high temperature for extraction, what's normally happening with palm oil. And we have digestate that we can use in soil. So use of byproducts and waste, it's a no-brainer. Reduction of carbon footprint, no ships anymore. I heard the word ship also in your presentation, because otherwise we import from Asia to here. No distillation temperatures, so low environmental impact. Alternative for palm oil, which is, has now a negative um, impact in, in, in communication, and as expected, reduction of antibiotics. The second pillar is moving from products to services, transition services for the farmer. Or not only for the farmer, here we have a farmer that can also micro cooperation, which are also trending in Europe nowadays. Where we work with a fermentation process, here I have MCFV, but it can be whatever fermentation process that we have available. I take the same example as the previous one to make it easy. And then we use local labor, local raw materials from these prospective countries, and local animals to get it fed, yeah, to provide a healthy compound on site. We call this service model health as a service. If you do it for nutrition, it's nutrition as a service. It's somewhere in terminology stolen from the ICT business, but for instance, Excel, Word, all these programs were the same principle. So that's where we also aim for at Agriproof, looking for service models instead of selling products. So it means we can work globally with local renewable resources, reduce carbon footprint, and create more time. So it means the value propositions for that are use of byproducts feed for feed principle. And the good element, I will not repeat everything on the slide, is that when you certify this process, you can even have an extra quality label for your company. And I'm aware in the meantime that some companies already think in that to have a sustainability index next to a GMP plus label as an expert. The next one is out of scope here. I already heard that some people already think on, on biodiversity index. It improves nutrition and you have health and sporting by adding less additives, preferentially no additives. So to conclude my talk, I have still a few seconds. Yeah. The basics, the linear co low cost formulation is most probably or will become soon something of the past. We have to see where we can create new profit for all stakeholders along the chain. And this value, this profit can be sold in environment. That's why a lot of companies today implement LCA studies in their experiments, but also look for social impacts. And with that new value, everyone deserves a decent place to live. And that's indeed where Agriimprove wants to form its ideas at this soil. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Geert, for your nice talk. Um, there's time for questions. 
has anyone uh, everyone, anyone have any question uh, at the moment? I'll have a look. I don't see any hands now. And again, it's no judgment. It's open discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Feel free to, uh, or maybe share your thoughts. It's also uh, it's fine. Um, then I will. Uh, I like to uh, ask you a question. Um, so, what about uh, the metrics in uh, animal nutrition uh, nowadays? So the nowadays they're mostly based on animal-centric approaches. Um, so, do you expect a change in the metrics in the future of livestock production? Yes, today I think the major one of the major ones, especially in poultry production, is the feed conversion ratio, mm. eh? where we have, uh, for instance, five, five points difference that that that, that we need uh, to make a difference with the competition. Um, for sure, this is still valid. But what I think in the future is that this is not the only factor anymore. In the future, you will have new metrics. Eh? For instance, the amount of CO2 that is produced to create an additive or a functional feed ingredient. Mm -hmm. So these extra labels, what you already see in the food industry appearing today, will most probably already appear also on, other, um, on the label of the future of uh, agriculture products, including feed additives, functional ingredients, and so on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm looking around again. No questions, I think. No, okay. Then um, I'd like to thank you, Heert. So uh, please uh, give him a, a big round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and then we move on with our third speaker. So uh, our third speaker is Claire Ledon. She is poultry production man manager at Mix Science, and in her presentation, she will talk about how to manage performance in an antibiotic-free pool poultry farming model. Please uh, come to the stage and let's give uh, a clear, warm uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, for attending today. Um, about uh, my presentation, uh, here you have the order. Uh, first, I will uh, uh, introduce uh, the topic and uh, give you some uh, information about our company and uh, our uh, group. Uh, then I will uh, explain in few words uh, the challenge we have about uh, free uh, antibiotic production. Uh, then I will give uh, some way uh, to reach uh, this uh, target with a feed strategy focus. And then the Q&A uh, part uh, will finish uh, my uh, presentation. Um, let me give you some information about uh, our uh, group, Avril Group. Uh, it's a group uh, involved in uh, many activities uh, like uh, animal nutrition, uh, human food, and uh, re renewable um, uh, biochemistry and energy. Um, we are uh, 7,500 employees worldwide. And um, our purpose is to serve the earth. Uh, and of course, for that, uh, our ambition uh, is to be uh, embodied in six uh, commitments uh, to take action. Uh, for example, uh, for the climate, we develop uh, any renewable energy called um, Oleo 100. It's 100% uh, uh, vegetal. vegetal 100% uh, uh, with non uh, GMO free, sorry. And uh, with this uh, biodiesel, we can uh, reduce our uh, carbon footprint. About uh, mix science, as we are uh, an average group uh, subsidiary, uh, our positioning uh, is uh, concrete, uh, deeply involved in uh, sustainability. And uh, we can resume it in four main pillars as uh, health, welfare, environment, and product quality. And we are always uh, innovating and contributing, contributing to the development of uh, sustainable animal farming. Uh, if we have a focus on uh, our poultry uh, activity, uh, it represents uh, 2.6 uh, million a uh, ton of poultry treat treated uh, all over the world. Uh, our activity is shared uh, 
uh, between France and international, with 70% of our activity in France. And um, we have a two-third uh, activity in meat poultry. And uh, we are involved in all kinds of uh, market, mar market. We support um, on cover uh, conventional market, but also free range market, and then organic market. The main species uh, we are focused on is uh, broiler, both in France and international, but also laying ants, turkeys, uh, or game birds. Of course, uh, we are uh, completely focused on market expectation. Uh, we know that competitiveness uh, is a key of success for all the market, and uh, also uh, zootechnical performance. Uh, but now, more and more uh, customers are uh, looking for any response to bacterial challenge uh, in order to reduce uh, antibiotic use. My presentation will focus on the two last points without uh, forgetting the two uh, previous. Now I will present you uh, the challenge uh, to produce without any antibiotic. Uh, this challenge can be resumed uh, as here. Uh, we have two main kinds of uh, antibiotics. The first is AGP. Uh, there are many used to promote uh, poultry on the um, poultry performance uh, facing infl inflammatory uh, reaction. Uh, but we have also a curative antibiotic, and these are used to treat any ongoing infection, uh, targeting any pathogen depending on the selective uh, molecu molecule we have. Uh, the two kinds of antibiotics have one common target to limit the pathogen development. Of course, if we want to um, succeed in any challenge of antibiotic-free production, we have to reduce this development of uh, pathogen and it's our strategy. Our approach uh, is uh, summed up here. Uh, we have uh, five main pillars to reduce antibiotic uh, use in uh, poultry production uh, with farm management, prophylaxis, for example, with a good program of vaccination. We have cheap quality on starter management, management. We know that the starter period is a critical period for pathogen development. We have biosecurity. On the last point we have, it feed on nutrition. I will focus today on feed on nutrition. Here you have any overview of a feed solution we can have. Uh, the first we have is the raw material knowledge. Uh, if you know well raw material uh, in your matrix for formulation, you will uh, use it well and well valorize, valorize them and uh, reduce the quantity of undigestible uh, nutrients you will have uh, in your feed. When you formulate, you have to take into account the feed presentation to improve feed intake. And thanks to this feed presentation, you will have a good digestion. For dig digestion, we have many different solutions to improve it, uh, but many feed additives. Then the other point we have is absorption. Absorption uh, will be improved if you have uh, any higher retention time in the gut and a good intestinal integrity. With these four key points, you will increase the nutrient use and you will decrease the quantity of nutrient and digested, and they will be uh, not available anymore for pathogens. Of course, you will also decrease excretion on waste, and this is more sustainable. To ensure absorption, we have to support uh, microbiota balance. We have uh, common soil bacteria like Dactobacil, Back to Lacillus, sorry. And uh, this lactobacil uh, will consume uh, many uh, amino acids. For 3 to 6% of amino acid digestible, you will give on your, on in your field. So it's very important to have 
this lactobacillus in a good quantity, but not too much in the gut. And you have to limit them in the upper part of gut and to decrease um, and to increase them the most as possible at the end of uh, your gut. Of course, we have the other part of uh, bacteria. Uh, you have pathogenic bacteria, for example, Clostridium, which is uh, the main pathogen we have uh, in poultry, causing uh, enteritis. And this uh, pathogen bacteria will also um, damage the gut wall with uh, bacteria toxin. And uh, we have to avoid them and to give them the less nutrients as possible in the gut. So for that, we have to increase uh, nutrient digestibility. For improving uh, digestibility, we have many solutions, but here I propose you to um, have a focus on a phytase. And uh, for the moment, in many formulations, uh, we have superdosing phytase to improve FCR. Um, in this uh, trial run in our research station, uh, we use uh, two different dosages of uh, phytase in turkeys and uh, a single dose of phytase, 550 uh, uh, units and a double dosage. And uh, here you can see that we have any improvement of uh, FCR by two points. That means we increase uh, the digestibility of our feed with a double dosage uh, of phytase. So we have less nutrient available for, for pathogens in the gut. Uh, another solution to improve digestibility uh, is to use uh, the, um, the grinding uh, you choose to regulate the passage rate uh, in the gut. Uh, still in our uh, research station, we run a trial with a different kind of uh, grinding uh, one with hammer mill and another with disc mill uh, in order to have a different kind of grinding across on very fine grinding. And here you can see that when you have a cross uh, grinding with disc mill, we have an improvement of uh, protein digestibility. So you will reduce the nutrients available for pathogen, but you, you will also uh, have a better use of nutrients it's also uh, more sustainable. Another point to decrease the quantity of nutrients available for pathogen is to uh, know well the raw material, but also to adapt ideal protein for a better absorption of amino acid available for the, uh, the animals. Uh, in our research station, we compare six groups uh, with uh, optimal condition in green and challenging condition. Challenging condition is a model we developed uh, with um, uh, litter, uh, with a straw, uh, with uh, no enzyme to challenge animal uh, to be closer uh, to a field condition. And we compare three levels of uh, protein, the standard one, with uh, two other, with minus one and minus two point of crude protein. And we adapt uh, the ideal uh, protein uh, with uh, amino acid added in uh, our formula. And here you can see um, whatever you are in uh, an optimal condition or in challenging condition, uh, you have a still good uh, level of FCR. Um, even if you reduce the quantity of crude protein you have as you will adjust the amino acid uh, profile you have in formula. And about pododermatitis uh, notation, you can see you will even have an improvement of this uh, scoring uh, thanks to the reduction of uh, crude protein you have on a better uh, amino acid profile. So that means uh, you will can you can keep the performance level you have without any have any uh, adverse uh, effect on gross performance on welfare. Uh, now I will uh, share you another 
uh, opportunity we have to ensure uh, absorption. Uh, it's to have a good microbiota balance. Um, I will share you any uh, trial, uh, trial we, we did uh, in Belgium uh, with uh, any Clostridium challenge and we compare control, control with uh, AGP and another uh, trial with Lumigard most at uh, one kilo. Uh, it's a completely new product uh, with uh, uh, fatty acid ester, a specific combination of fatty acid ester in order to face uh, the most as possible the range of bacteria we can have in, uh, in monogastric. And here, uh, the challenge was uh, with the Clostridium to uh, evaluate the benefit you can have with this kind of solution. Uh, the challenge was with uh, both a field, with fish meal on rye, but also with any in uh, inoculation, sorry, with Clostridium and Emeria until 24 uh, days of age. Um, if we focus on the proportion of lactobacillus we have uh, thanks to the product, uh, if we compare with uh, bacteria profile we have with uh, antibiotic, you can see in purple that the quantity of uh, lactobacillus are increased uh, thanks to the product utilization. So that means we have a better uh, balanced uh, microbiota. And uh, the benefit uh, can also be seen with the performance as we have uh, a better performance uh, increased by three points in comparison with uh, any control uh, group. So the benefit you have with the um, uh, microflora profile, you will also uh, get it with uh, on performance. And uh, the last uh, trial I wanted to share uh, is uh, without any uh, challenge. Uh, we still have any uh, improvement of uh, FCR with a good benefit on pododermatitis uh, with a significant uh, improvement of uh, scoring with less um, uh, severe uh, scoring of pododermatitis. So even if you have a better performance, you can also have an improvement of uh, welfare. So welfare and performance are not uh, antagonists. In conclusion, uh, as the time is uh, over, uh, I wanted to say that uh, free antibiotic production is possible uh, if you limit the pathogen uh, as a key uh, of success um, and you have a well-balanced uh, microbiota. To have a well-balanced microbiota, uh, you have to get a good digestion, but also absorption of uh, nutrients. And uh, feed and nutrition are, of course, very important but they have to be uh, in account in an entire uh, approach to succeed uh, without f forgetting farm management, for example. And uh, we can have feed additive like Lumigard Most as other solution in a global approach in a feed on uh, nutrition. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you. Any questions to Claire? No? Okay. Then uh, Claire, I've uh, thrown down a question. So um, what could be your main recommendations for integrators or farmers to adapt their farm management in uh, an antibiotic-free uh, production? Um, well, uh, yes, today it was a focus on the feed or nutrition uh, strategy. Uh, of course, we do not forget that there is many other uh, level to act uh, to succeed. Uh, farm management in was, uh, is one of the key points of uh, success. And in farm management, I think uh, uh, biosecurity is very important, uh, including uh, cleaning and disinfection, on barn prepara preparation before any uh, new uh, flock. And uh, I think starter management is also very important. And the last point I could recommend is uh, biocontrol. Uh, you can uh, add uh, uh, probiotic in the environment to support 
uh, biosecurity, uh, but also uh, starting uh, period. Okay, thank you. Um, no questions, I think? No? Okay, then, Claire, I'd like to thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry I didn't see you. <laughs> uh, what's your view on combined application of probiotic and antibiotic together? Uh, you mean probiotic uh, uh, in environment, was I saying? Oh, but when you, well, basically when you combine an mm -hmm. application, antibiotic and probiotic. Uh, I think it's uh, quite uh, complicated, um, depending on the molecule you will use uh, as antibiotic. Uh, if, they are in the, if the probiotic you are using uh, are in the spectrum of your antibiotic molecule, you won't have uh, any ex expecting effect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No. <laughs> then, uh, Claire, thank you. Uh, big applause for Claire, and thank, thank you, you for being here. And then it's already time for our last speaker, our fourth speaker. Uh, <laughs> Last but not least, of course, <laughs> welcome, Mark much. Karimi. And he is pool tree technical manager at AB NEO. And uh, you will talk about efficiency, a key sure. uh, factor towards sustainable broiler production. That's it. Thank you very much. The the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for uh, attending. And this, this room is quite cold, isn't it? Which is very good, actually. I mean, you just, you know, you don't fall asleep and you're alert and good. I mean, <laughs> I need some <laughs> movement. Okay, right. Uh, what I uh, prepare for you, well, the, 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 uh, the title is Efficiency, a Key Factor Towards Sustainable Broiler Production. Uh, well, this is, this is, this is the, uh, you know, comment that I, I uh, try to prove, which is something that you should think about a bit more. Okay, my name is Mark Karimi. I'm working for AB New as poultry uh, technical manager. AB New is a part of AB Agri, which is probably the biggest agriculture company in uh, in Britain. Uh, AB Agri is belong to AB Food, which is even bigger company. Uh, after this short introduction, let's see what I'm going to talk about in this very short presentation. 15 minutes is, is very short for such a presentation, but I'm trying to just uh, stick to the point and uh, stick to the time as well. So I'm going to talk about the concept of sustainability. My, my the, the previous uh, speakers talk about the concept of sustainability. What is it exactly and what is our understanding? Then outline the issues associated with sustainability in animal production, in particular here, broiler production. Then uh, we just move to where the poultry production stands in regards to sustainability. Are we behind? Are we a bit uh, ahead? Uh, we are going to discuss it uh, in, 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 in a minute or, or so. And uh, answering the question, what to sustain in broiler production? When I say this, I'm talking about the people like myself who very closely uh, you know, work with the poultry production. I'm, I'm sure in this room, all you guys uh, working very closely with uh, poultry production. Uh, you are either farmers or the people who working with the feed industry. But when we work very closely, we need to focus on what we can do rather than what we can talk about. And then uh, <laughs> another uh, you know, uh, comment here, another statement, no solution is valid without facts and figures. Again, I'm going to show you a couple of interesting slides. They are very interesting uh, to me, I'm sure is going to be interesting to you as well, to just focus on facts and figures when we talk about any solution. So uh, I believe no solution is uh, valid without facts and figures. Okay, let's start. Sustainability and sustainable development Probably you can't read it because I can't read it <laughs> from here, but uh, the, the definitions in dictionaries are quite uh, straightforward. Uh, the previous uh, you know, uh, speaker talked about this. This is the dictionary, but in 1987, they just come up with something which is more practical rather than just a dictionary 
uh, definition. And in this uh, new definition or more practical definition, they talk about three things, economy, society, and environment. So these three elements are very, very important. However, during last 20 years or so, our understanding uh, improved a lot. So for example, you can see from here, the first one, society, environment, economy, was three separate elements. Then we said, oh, maybe they are related, and then interconnected. So the, our understanding has been changed, and I think still is changing, because we learn more and more about sustainability and how it does work. And then in 2000, the new um, elements add to these three elements that I told you, which is institutional. And institutional is everything about uh, uh, governments, uh, regulations, legislations, practices, everything else. And uh, made a prism like this that you can see. Uh, however, after that, even in 2004 and after that, we learned that it is not all about these elements as a separate elements. The interlinkage and the connection between them are very, very important. My message here is, without understanding all those interlinkages that you can see here and the connection between these three these four elements, you can't just you know, uh, talk about the solution. And probably, probably why we are a bit behind, which I believe we are quite behind in terms of industry when we talk about sustainability, is because our understanding of the whole system is not the best. And even the worst news is understanding of others are not the best towards us. Well, the example is when I talk to my friend, actually, which are not in agriculture business, their understanding of our business is nearly zero, so they can't help me. And my understanding of my own business is not even the best. So just imagine how bad it can be when we talk about sustainability. And I think this is the main reason why we are behind. OK, let's don't blame ourselves that much. <laughs> let's just uh, focus on the problem that we have. I, I just, uh, you know, um, um, just uh, add a few things that I think they are the most important challenges that all livestock around the world has. Um, but probably the first one, which is the direct of the intensive farming on environment. And the last one, which is antibiotic resistance, are two things that during the last 10 years probably people talk about a lot. And uh, today I'm, I'm not going to just talk about all of these things, but as I said, understanding of each and every you know, um, element is very important when we talk about sustainability. Let's, let's focus on something that we can do uh, things about that, and it is uh, it <coughs> environment. Okay, uh, when we focus on chicken and uh, considering that prism that I told you with social, economical, environmental, and institutional, these are the things that bother us, actually, as a people who are working directly with the uh, with, with broiler industry or with poultry industry. And as I said, I'm going to focus more on environmental aspects rather than anything else. To be honest, if you want to just cover all those things, we need a few days presentation and talk and discussion. But let's just focus on environment, something that we can do. And I'm going to share this very interesting slide with you. Poultry or um, broiler industry or meat broiler meat industry is a food industry, yeah? So we just produce it for the food. And it's better we compare things with the food. And greenhouse gas emission, which are all these actually, uh, are the biggest challenge in terms of environment when we talk about sustainability. However, when we have a look on the broiler, we can see that we are not that bad. I mean, look at the coffee and chocolate there. They produce more green gas uh, emission, or they emit the, 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 the pollute the environment more than uh, poultry, poultry meat, and egg even is, is much better. However, if, if we focus on poultry meat, 
you can see, oh, I, I hope you can read all those things, we can see that farms and animal feed are two biggest challenges for everybody. And the thing is, uh, we have to con concentrate or focus on these two things more than anything else probably, because the rest are not in our hand that much. And probably it is the reason that, uh, you know, when, when governments or, uh, you know, regulating bodies put the, you know, retailers under pressure about uh, environment, most of the time they come back to you, they say, okay, you should sort out your farms. And they never talk about their own problem, which is transport, processing, and everything else. Because, unfortunately, based on these findings, uh, they think packaging and processing is not that much issue in terms of greenhouse uh, emission. And farms and feed processing are the things that we should sort out. Okay, so we have to accept the, uh, the responsibility and work on it. Okay, and the question that I ask, what to sustain in broiler production? I believe as people who directly involved in these things, we have to accept the fact. And I think this is the fact. The broiler production around the world is still far from an optimum use of natural, energetic, material, and informational uh, you know, resources. We are a bit behind. We should accept this responsibility. Yes, we did a lot during last, I mean, 20, 25 years, 25 years that I'm working in this business. I saw better things every year. Every two years I came here and I saw some nice things, some nice products, but we are uh, still behind. We, we should accept this one. And the most important thing is, after accepting the responsibility, is what solutions are available? What can we do? And I think increasing in the efficiency of resources that we use in production is very important. So focus on increasing efficiency is something that we can do, and I believe we are doing at the moment, and we can do more. So in practice, how we can do that, I, again, I put some comments here, sorry about being wordy and put all the comments for you, but they are reality. For example, spotting all and every available tool to optimize productivity is important, yeah? We are not going to focus on very narrow things. Whatever available, we should focus on developing any eco-innovative techniques, yeah? So there are plenty of different techniques. We should go and find them and use them to improve the production efficiency in farms. And here that I'm going to talk about probably in the next three, four minutes that I have time is about the innovative ingredients. And the uh, innovative ingredients, well, everybody says my ingredients is innovative, but to me, innovative ingredients are the ingredients which work in a molecular level, not just, you know, say something. When, when we talk about the food, yeah, innovative ingredients can be very simple, but when we talk about the efficiency, they should work properly. And just about AB new, I mean, in, in last, uh, uh, especially in the last five, six years, AB New, you know, concentrated very, very, you know, um, seriously about innovation. We like innovation and we thought, okay, without any way innovation, probably we can't go forward. We, and when you can't go forward in any industry, uh, for sure you go backward. So it is not, not a place to stay still. And uh, yes, we work very hard through innovation and uh, we come up with a, a product called Alpha Soy Gold, which simply is a new generation functional protein for healthier production. And in next two slides, I show you some very interesting you know, data to show you when I say a, a, an innovative ingredient, what exactly means. Okay, here, we, I mean, there, there's a trial, yeah? We, we, we did a trial, actually. There are three groups, as you can see on the top, and in this trial, we wanted to just see if adding this product to the feed can change something within the molecular level. In this case, changing the enzyme reaction or enzyme producing or enzymatic reaction within the gut itself. Okay, what we did, we did the trial, you can see, I, in T1, 
trial one, I put 20% to a start for first three days, very, very, I mean, short period, but very important period. By the way, when we call ourselves AB new, new means a neonate, and neonate is very young animal. We concentrate on very young animal, and we believe if we help them in a very early stage, we can get plenty from them in later stage. So they, here, we just add the uh, product, 20%, 10%, four to 10 days, and then 5%, 11 to 21 days, and in T2, I just wanted to keep the minimum to see if I can see anything if I have just 5%. And in this case, I work on two different types of enzyme, enzymes which coming from the pancreas or the luminal enzymes which produce you know, in, the, in the gut itself. And let's see what, what we found here. Okay, to start, there are two enzymes, sucrase and maltase, which are brush border enzymes and I saw nothing happen. Okay, that, that's great because by adding alpha soy gold, I didn't you know, change anything about the carbohydrates. So I didn't add any substrate more. So the enzyme, as everybody probably knows in this room, enzymes working on substrate. If substrate is not there that much, so they are not you know, just doing that much. But the most interesting one here is aminopeptidase, as you can see, you know, significantly increase in three old days chicks. And it is very, very interesting. In a very early stage, you can see that aminopeptidase just, you know, show themselves in a more quantity, which is very, very important for the animal, which lack of, you know, um, enzyme production and lack of the experience, when I say experience, physiological experience of the gut to deal with the pressure or everything else. And interest, uh, in, in another interesting thing is trypsin and chemotrypsin. These enzymes are pancreas enzymes. And I learned here that this product can just increase the aminopeptidase and then nothing change about pancreas. So no pressure on pancreas. And you know that uh, the, the anti-nutritional factor like uh, trypsin inhibitors can just make pancreas to work harder and push these enzymes, you know, uh, push these enzymes production uh, more and more trypsin and chemotrypsin. But in this case, okay, everything's good. No, uh, you know, uh, change in sucrase and maltase. Good changes in aminopeptidase. No change in trypsin and chemotrypsin. And I got the gold. So the next one was in a very same uh, you know, uh, trial. We, this time, we just focus on uh, gene expression. And when you work with gene expression, you work with cytokines. I put the cytokines you know, definition there. What are they? Okay, they are proteins or glycoproteins molecules, which blah, 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 you can read it. But measuring these uh, cytokines as uh, biomarkers is very important. And we noticed that, yes, there are some differences between gene expressions uh, when we talk about inflammation. And inflammation is very important. Everybody in this room, I'm sure, knows how important inflammation is. More inflammation means more challenges to bear. Less inflammation mean, means good. But don't forget that inflammation is not a bad thing. It's the reaction of the whole system to control the problem. But if the controlling system is not on the control itself, then it causes the problem. Okay, so we have some pro-inflammatory uh, you know, cytokines like IL-2, TNF-alpha, INF-gamma, and anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-4. In this uh, trial, we try to see what happened to them. And well, this is, this is the procedure that we uh, followed actually from the sampling, very uh, you know, straightforward, cut the gut, get the sample, do the RNA extraction, pull the sample, and then we did some re reverse transcription to see if we can see any differences uh, for the you know, cytokines production within the gut. And this is the, this is the thing that I got. To a start, IL-4, which is one of those anti-inflammatory cytokines, nothing happened. Again, good news for me, because the addition of the products didn't change uh, IL-4 
and is good. So to a start, I didn't harm my animal, but as uh, we go further, I saw very interesting things. All those, uh, you know, pro-inflammatory cytokines just, you know, uh, not, not only controlled, and, uh, but also go down. You can see, you know, when, when I had 20% ASG, all the cytokines, you know, just decrease their, their, their you know, um, um, their, 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 what, what I can call it, well, I, I have to be careful what, what word I, I use, but uh, the, the presence or gene expression for those anti-inflammatory cytokines significantly decrease, significantly decrease. I mean, in T2, I can see they decrease, but in 20%, it was very nicely show me that, okay, this product in a molecular level work very well. I mean, I am a bit behind and I have to be faster. So it was my last slide. And uh, I, I'm sorry to just, you know, uh, talk too much for my time. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. You're forgiven. I think uh, it was a really uh, interesting talk and uh, everyone is still awake. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's Good because of the cold or yeah. <laughs> so, uh, any questions for Mark? No. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. So you shared a lot of details about the effects, but how important is it to know the uh, mode of action ah. of uh, uh, feed ingredients? Yeah. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I didn't show any details. <laughs> <laughs> Just two uh, slides, nothing. <laughs> uh, but uh, behind this uh, slide, I, I, I have a presentation, which is, believe it or not, one and a half hour presentation. Whenever you like, I can present Maybe for all next time those then. details <laughs> where they're coming from. But I, as, as I said uh, through my presentation, knowing the, the mode of action is important because uh, simply you are not going to use one or two or three ingredients within, within your feed when you want to just uh, solve a problem. Yeah? So as a usual, you put different things and the system is working always in a different way. Uh, just give you an example, in, in, in those enzyme reactions that I told you, if I change the whole enzymatic reaction in, in, a, in a gut system, it is no good because there are plenty of other things within the gut, as uh, one of the previous speakers said, the microbiome is very important. You are not going to change the microbiome that much. So whatever you put in your feed, you shouldn't put the whole system under pressure. Everything should be controlled. And knowing the mode of action help you to understand how it does work and what potentials are available to you to do some changes or alteration. Mm. This is the reason that I really like to know whatever I do, what is the mode of action. Mm. This is the reason. Okay, thank you, that's clear. Any questions? No, don't think so. Then ah, I'm off the hoof. <laughs> That's good. I like to thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So everybody. a big applause for Mark. And uh, that brings us to the end of this seminar. And uh, of, of course, first I'd like to thank our speakers for being here and for uh, sharing their uh, their insights with us for the nice presentations. Um, I like uh, to thank our online uh, participants for joining us. And of course, everyone here. And I wish you uh, a nice day at the rest uh, of Eurotier. So thank you. <laughs>